Hey, welcome to the show. Total Financial Solutions, Save for Money Hour. Welcome back. Eric Hallaby, Jeff Gerard. Okay, we're talking about uh, some of the things you need to do as you're planning for retirement. Let's say you, you retired or you're just about ready to retire. Leave the job. Maybe go do something else. A lot of folks are, are retiring into another uh, position. Uh, it could be a whole other career choice. It even, for most people, is an option that they've always wanted to do, but just never felt like they could afford to do it. But today they have a retirement account that can subsidize their income or their children have grown, their expenses are less, so they're less likely to need massive amounts of dollars. Well, what do you do with your retirement account when you leave, when you retire? <clears throat> One of the other choices that we see is something we call layering. Now, when I say layering, I don't think of it, you know, like going outside and, and uh, you know, putting on different layers of clothes just to keep warm. <laughs> layering is the same thing that, that is called laddering. You might have heard laddering of CDs, layering or laddering. What does it do? It sets up the option for you to have multiple sources of income later on that is diversified. Meaning when you sit down with your financial professional, putting all your eggs in one basket doesn't always work to your benefit. It's not, it's not 100% wrong. Uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve. But if you have an account, it may make sense to put some in a seven year, some in a 10 year or seven, 10 and 14 or something like that. Meaning that just like you're going to need the money later on down the road and things change, maybe the accounts can have different features. I like that because I think the important thing to remember here is no matter where the money is, once you spend it, it will never ever. Let me say this again. Once it leaves <laughs> yeah. the account and you spend it, it will never go back and capture any interest for you. Not have any earnings. It's just, it's pretty much done. Those dollars are spent and gone. So whatever money you leave behind is really the important part. And uh, the whole conversation here is how much do I really need to take out right now or at least the next year? And then you have to think maybe three or five years or seven years out. And what Eric's talking about is you can have some of the money accessible now and the money that you don't need for five years or seven years from now can go to work for you in a, in a different type of account perhaps, and then start to spit out income at that seven year mark. So the money that you thought you needed access to, you might be able to tie that up a little bit in a CD or an annuity type of, a, of an account where you might get some type of features that you don't have in the current account. So that 401k or that retirement plan where you have uh, that you have set up right now, that might be doing fine, but you may want to take parts of that and move it into different layered accounts so that they can kick in at different times of your retirement. You know, part of this process is uh, thinking about the purpose of each of these accounts, meaning there are some accounts that have a, a really good feature that says, as long as you take this money out in income beginning 10 years from now, then it's perfect. You're going to have higher rates of return. You have a great potential to have a greater amount of, of income on a monthly basis. So there are accounts that have a job to do, which is basically to take the place of a pension. Think of it like that. Its job is to say, hey, we're going to give you that systematic payment, but it's going to begin 10 years from now, 12, 15 years from now. Now you go, gosh, Arif, that's such a long time. I'm 50 years old, you know, 10 years. I know it's going to come sooner than I think, but, but I want money beforehand. Perfect. There are other accounts that say, you know, I want to have money on a monthly basis, but not beginning till, you know, a year or two years from now. Mm -hmm. Remember, one of the things we talked about at first was consider your needs. If your needs are, hey, I need this money, but I need it to start next month or in six months, that's different. You want to layer your account so you have money today, but also money for the future. One of the biggest mistakes that we see, I see two big mistakes. Number one, people say that when they retire, the reason or, or the biggest mistake they make is that they retire. That they retired, right. <laughs> and you go, well, what does that mean? It means that I have found that consistently people that retire that think it's a mistake are the ones that just sit around and do nothing or because they have friends that are either less financially capable or they are less financially capable and their friends are saying, hey, I'm retired as well. Hey, let's go to Europe for a 10-day cruise. Well, they go, I can't afford to go there. I, I can afford to retire, but not to do those extra things. Well, your friends are off without you. 
So, or you're the one that says, hey, let's go off to Europe for a 10 day cruise. And your friends say, that's nice, but we can't afford to do that. So you're going to have instances where you need to be economically conjoined with the right people in your life so that as you move forward, you can experience the same things, you can travel, you can uh, enjoy life. The, the paychecks and play checks, right? The play checks are a big part of the enjoyment of retirement. Otherwise, you're going to sit around and hang out. Right, because how scary is it to see a big nest egg that you're supposed to live off of the rest of your life and maybe you're taking out a few thousand dollars a month already from this account and then, oh, by the way, a trip to Europe costs five thousand dollars and then you see that go down another five thousand and you didn't spend it on bills or anything else. And so there's a sense of guilt that people have or they're scared to spend that money because they don't know if it's going to come back. They don't know if their accounts are going to be earning more than they're taking out, if they're going to be able to keep up with inflation or the, the cost of living as it increases over time. So all of these unknowns cause people to do what? not spend their money. And how many times, Eric, have you seen someone that is afraid to spend their money, even though you're looking at it from a different a different perspective? You know, they're in the trench, they have the, the sides, if you will, you know, 10 feet high on, on either side, and all they can see is forward. I have to preserve my principle. I have to make sure I don't spend all my money because it's got to be there for me for the rest of my life. And then on the outside, we're going, hey, based on, you know, this this experience that we have, you could probably never go through this money living comfortably, but they don't see it that way. Yeah, there's a fear that component that goes through uh, a lot of us when there's unknown. And the fear of the unknown, of unknown whether or not financially we're going to have consistent income, fear of what's going to happen with the election and the economy and next year and next month and the housing and all of those kinds of things can create a fear component that really don't allow us to live. And Jeff, I've seen this where folks will have worked really hard, sacrificed, given to others, spent their entire life in a position where they have been selfless. And today it's now time for them to enjoy life, to buy a nicer car or to uh, take a nice trip or to do things for their friends or family. And they're just afraid. And we want to make sure that you understand that by layering your accounts, having income kick in at different times in your life, three years, five years, 10 years, or five, seven, 10, you can, and being flexible with that is important, right? We have seen, Jeff, that flexibility is the key. I think it's one of the biggest keys to a happy retirement because things change. That's right. They really can. I mean, it can be a, a market condition that can change. It can be an economic condition. I mean, we see a lot of changes on the horizon. But one of the things I think people can really do is create a constant. If you have an amount of money that you know is coming to you every single month, whether it's a pension or some type of annuity payment, and it takes the place of you having to worry and you say, no matter how bad I mess up, no matter how much money I spend, I know next month or next quarter or next year, X amount of dollars is going to be deposited into my account. What a nice feeling is that? Yeah, it's, it's similar to people that decide uh, to work for a government job where it's consistent and they know the checks there, as opposed to the old days of working with aerospace, right? Aerospace, you would be laid off every six months or every right. 18 months. Uh, maybe today there's different uh, industries that have these layoffs that could consist. Of, remember the auto industry, they would ramp yes. up. We need to hire a bunch of folks. They hire them, they work, and then they get laid off. And there, there was that constant ebb and flow. So a lot of folks said, you know what, never mind that. I'm going to go work for a steady paycheck. And that steady paycheck is similar to the retirement, expecting whether it's a big company pension, Social Security, or just your own money from a big company that's paying it out each and every month or every year. But that flexibility is key. Here's what I mean by that. You may have young grandchildren, everything's fine and you retire. But eight or 10 years from now, those young grandchildren are gonna to go to college and maybe their dad or mom was laid off and they can't afford it. And you might say, I wanna be able to help a little bit with college, $5,000. Maybe not pay for everything, but I wanna give them 5,000. How bad will this impact my retirement income? People ask us that. They come in, we sit down, we look at things, and we just tell them this is exactly how it is. And they have a chance to look at that and say, you know, I can afford that, or I can, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. Or in many cases, believe it or not, Jeff, it's not even that. It's like, well, you know what? It's not gonna affect it at all. 
Mm-hmm. You know, unless you live to 117 years old, then we're going to start having problems. But <laughs> before right. then, we're okay. Well, and I think it'd be a bit short-sighted of us to think that that 5000 is only going to cost us $5,000. You know, maybe you have an account that maybe you just have that 5000 sitting in savings and you want to give that to your to your grandchildren for their college that might not cost you anything in taxes but if you've got to pull that from a 401k or an IRA or something that has not been taxed yet the cost of that $5000 goes up a bit doesn't it you have to consider that you haven't paid taxes on this and it might cost you 7000 to give 5 so that would be part of the uh, the conversation there at least the consideration of how much uh, of a of a gift can i actually sustain yeah, you know, and that is uh, how do you give it and from what account, right? Because each account can have a different taxability, whether the account's coming from your IRA, your checking account, you know, those kinds of things are important. Be very careful because part of what, what this process is, is to not just decide how much you're giving somebody, but from where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. And that uh, flexibility of taking money out from one account or another is key. In addition to all of that, Jeff, you know, one of the things that I've seen is people think that they're going to uh, re- uh, travel next year or the oh. year after. Yep. And one of the things that we have brought, I, we try to bring home to folks is that this is the youngest and the healthiest they're ever going to be most likely on the healthy side. That's right. I don't think you could have said it better. And and postponing these types of things, not only are you, uh, you know, declining in health possibly, but but in age. But mind you, you're spending money along the way. And if you think that maybe this year isn't the year, do you think having maybe a little bit money, a little bit less money next year, is going to make you feel any more confident about taking that trip? Uh, I don't know what people are waiting for. It's it's probably, uh, you know, we've talked about that red zone, the, the five years before you have and the five years after you retire. Those first five years is where, generally speaking, people spend the most of, of their wealth. They spend the most money. And we've talked about having, you know, six or seven Saturdays in a row. Uh, that's basically what retirement is like and, and probably should be. So budgeting for that. I think budgeting for that travel and then maybe after that five years saying that you have maybe it's a reunion across, uh, you know, across country. Maybe you get together with some family or you just say, hey, look, we're going to take a family trip somewhere. I think allocating some of that money, having a little bit that's just set aside for that trip, then you don't feel guilty about taking it out of your monthly paychecks. And that's that's key to living is that in retirement, you still have to save money. In other words, if you have pension dollars coming in. Learning to live within that budget and underneath that budget is very important. Not just spending everything you make as if, uh, you know, this is, um, I don't know, the lotto or something. Right. So retirement assets, you have this big bucket of money, you have income coming in. Okay, fine. You can take out a little less or a little more, but saving some in in a savings account, in a place for emergencies uh, is still key because emergencies still happen, Jeff, in retirement. Water heaters still need to be fixed. You still need tires on the car. Doesn't change. Unless you don't have a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to budget for a bus pass or a, or a train ticket or something. <laughs> then you're yeah. going to need a new pair of shoes because yeah. you're going to walk That's the bus. right. So <laughs> you're going to have to have something. But those layers are important. And, and I think what we didn't touch on is, is the layers that are built into your retirement should include an emergency account. So as they're saying, you know, you may, you may take in four or five thousand dollars from your pension or from your IRA or retirement account distributions. Uh, you're taking from those accounts to help supplement your life. But let's let's remember here that we should not live on 100% of what we're bringing in. So you might be able to either a take less from those other accounts if your if your uh, pension or whatever income stream is coming in is not enough, or you just say, look, I'm going to make this a bill. I'm going to treat it just like a cable or a cell phone bill. I'm going to save, you know, whether it's 5, 10, 20% and you turn that into an expense and that's a surefire way to make sure that you have some emergency account. You uh, know, and you had mentioned earlier that's another way to pay for some of these expensive uh what I say expensive uh, expenses that are coming along mm-hmm. whether that's a cruise once a year or look, I would encourage you if you like to do something golf or or travel, do those things as often as you would like. Don't just say, well, because when I worked, I had a one week vacation a year, so I'm going to do that one week. No, no, no. Remember, you're not working anymore. You might be able to do it once every other month or once every six months. Those are important parts to still living, being active, and more importantly, keeping your mind active. You know, studies are showing more and more as we go through life 
that keeping your mind active, having something to do, and that emotional health part of it, I think, and what I've seen and what's come across is simple. Keeping relevant, being important in other people's lives, being important in the lives of people that care about you, having a place to go, not every day, but every other day, a few days a week, people are counting on you, showing up, whether it's you know volunteering at the church cook-off, whether it's uh, meeting friends for coffee, whether it's a volunteer at the, uh, at the assistance league, being involved where you are helping others and people missing you, if you don't show up, I think makes all of the difference in your emotional health. I have seen it. It's an unofficial study, but it has made a difference. We're going to be back in just a minute. We're going to continue with a couple of our last things to do with your retirement account. Not to forget some key components. When you are ready to retire, what do you do with the account? What do you do with the money? Is it just you take it all out? Do you just leave it there? There's some options. We'll cover that and a whole lot more. I'm Eric Hallaby along with Jeff Gerard on Total Financial Solutions Safer Money Hour. This is your place for news, talk, and information. AM 1220 KHTS. Hey, welcome back to the show. Total Financial Solutions, Safer Money Hour. All right, what do you do with your retirement account? You're retired. You have your retirement account. You've heard us talk on many times uh, on the show. You're leaving your job. Why do you leave your retirement account behind? Sometimes it's the right thing to do, but most of the times you lose uh, flexibility that you're looking for, especially if you're looking for income payments or systematic withdrawals or protecting the principal if the market goes down, how do you keep yourself from losing? Uh, so sometimes we say, look, uh, moving the account is often the right thing to do, but take a look at what I think is one of the more important things to look at. You're going to pass away someday, surprise, and when you do, you're going to leave money behind to somebody who didn't earn it. In other words, they did not go to school, work, sacrifice, and come up with money at the end of the day. They just, it just didn't happen. So uh, it's your money. I don't think the government should give us rules and who gets what or tax it uh, in, in any special way as if they're in front of the, the people that want the money. It, it should be yours. If you want to give it to the stranger, you can give it to a stranger. You want to give it to somebody else, give it to somebody else. However, and this is important. You have the ability to decide who, when, where, and how people receive your money. Did you know that? And that is important when you're looking at putting it inside of a trust or even just a straight beneficiary. That's right. And when you set these accounts up, I can't tell you how many times, and I can't even believe that this is still a possibility when this is being set up. Here's what I mean. When you go to a new job and you open up, let's just say a 401k, and that could mean any retirement plan we're talking about. But when you go and open up your retirement plan, your 401k at work, where you put your name and your address and your investment options and all that, how much you're going to be putting in, don't forget to put in a beneficiary. That's the person that would receive the money if you were to pass away. If you don't do that, you open up a whole boatload of problems with potential probate, getting that money to the people that you intended it to go to, uh, but now you have to have an attorney or they have to have an attorney. You're gone. It's not your problem anymore. They have to hire an attorney a lot of times, someone that specializes in that. And my goodness, uh, let's hope that they hire the person that really knows how to do this. I have a friend right now who has inherited quite a bit of wealth and a lot of things were uh, named in a fashion that it went directly to him. He's an only child. No one's disputing any of that. But when he went to the bank to claim uh, just a regular checking account that his father had, his mother passed a couple years ago. His father just recently passed in the last few months. He went to claim the account and there was either a box not checked or something wasn't named properly uh -oh. and they tied up uh, somewhere around a quarter million dollars. Oh my. Yeah, so he's got to wait on that. And, and look, the, the estate still has expenses. There are things to keep up within the properties and of all the, the commercial properties and the rentals and things like that. So is he going to just take it from his pocket and his family's livelihood to continue that legacy? Well, there's money that needs to be paid out. So he needs access to that. So all of that to say, when you leave your estate, make sure there's a name on the other side. Yeah, there's uh, some options you have. Uh, look, who do you want to receive this money? When, how, this is very important. Today, you may have younger children or immature people or people that 
that are still trying to figure out life or that might have legal issues. So you may have provisions in place today that are different than you're going to want five or 10 or 15 years from now. So having that flexibility in the documents, seek the advice of an estate planning attorney. Many people think that they can do it on their own. And for maybe very simple ones, it might be okay. But most of us, if you have any kind of wealth at all, I mean $100,000 or more uh, of life insurance or a home or uh, retirement accounts, anything, and you don't want it to just go to somebody who might blow it in 15 minutes, then there are some rules you can put in place through a living trust, through a will, where they sit down and they say, you know, Mary can receive this money, but only if this, this, and this happens. Or Mary can receive this money, but it's supposed to only go towards her room and board or her tuition or the purchase of a new home as long as the home is only under her name, right? Not her husband who maybe you know that they have marital issues back and forth and you don't want your money to go to his new girlfriend because that's what will happen, right? <laughs> right. Because he'll get half or she'll give up the house just to keep, you know, custody of the kids. So now she has the house, that's gone, goes to him, his new wife, he dies, aye, aye, aye. your money goes to some girlfriend's you know, 18-year-old son. So you can put those provisions in place through your living trust to make sure that whomever you choose to receive this money does receive it. How and when, and as things change, because they're going to. Hopefully they'll either get better or they'll get, maybe they'll get worse. But if they get better, you can change those provisions and say, you know what, you can actually have more of this money or you can have it all. You're now 40 years old. I trust you're going to make good decisions. It's yours. If I pass away and you're 40 years old, here's your money. Uh, and and you're going to see a lot of times that some people are, you know, kind of in their in their building phase. And as they are growing in their family size and their wealth, they may not want to leave everything to their kids. They may say, look, I want my parents or even a, you know, a sibling on the same level or even an uncle to come in and kind of be that mediator or someone that is the voice of reason. Now, as you get older, you know, maybe fast forward 15 or 20 years, and let's say your folks or that relative has passed away. If they've passed away and they're in a position of power in your estate, now that kind of ties things up. So where I'm going with this is make sure you update things as life events change. Did that person that just passed away have anything to do with the control of your wealth and your estate after you pass away? You may want to take a look at that and revise some of those documents. So there's some, there's some key components here. One of those is who, when, and how. When you decide those three things, who do you want to receive it? When do you want them to receive it? And how? whether it's in monthly payments, whether it's all at once, whether it's half now and half later, you can make those plans ahead of time, but consider using a revocable living trust that gives you those options. Uh, because look, sometimes the kids are young and they're, they're, you don't know when you're gonna pass away. You know, Very few people have that date written down. Uh, and because of that, you have to have a just in case and all sorts of provisions. Okay, last one I want to cover here is don't forget the charities and the tax man. Mm -hmm. When we say that, we say, listen, most people meet your CPA about once a year, and it's usually a rushed event. It's usually sitting down. It's a one-way conversation where he or she is asking questions and you are delivering the information back rather quickly. And it is not conducive to creating a plan or a strategy or, or a program that says over the next 12 months, how can I create a time uh, where I am uh, putting money inside, I know what I'm doing, how do I create that opportunity? I think you have to set up a time with your CPA. I think so too. And, and the best time to do that is after the tax filing deadline. So yeah. after April 15th, for, for most years, sometimes you get a little extension here and again to the 18th, but probably after April, maybe sometime in May or June, when when the dust settles, so to speak, you can sit down with your with your tax preparer or your CPA and, and bend their ear a little bit. Say, hey, what can I do? Look, I just I just paid a whole bunch of money in taxes. I know you did your best to save you know, on that expense, but what can I do going forward? Is there something I can do with my company retirement plan? Should I be putting more money into that so that I can defer more of my income from taxes this year? Should I be opening up uh, an IRA? 
Should I look at some other types of accounts that are tax advantaged that might give me maybe not the benefit this year, but down the road in two or three or 10 years from now? So those are the types of conversations where it's not just filling out forms, you know, signing everything and making it, you know, getting your return in the mail before, you know, the deadline closes. Yeah, and this is important when you're trying to plan uh, whether or not to give money to charities, whether or not uh, to give money to uh, organizations that uh, one could use it. Do you give it to them while you're still alive? Look, there are a lot of people that have a charitable bent. In other words, they care about other organizations, whether it's puppy dogs or or uh, homeless people or children, right? There's all sorts of charities and religious organizations that need and deserve your money hospitals that serve the underprivileged, Boy Scouts. These are amazing organizations that make a difference for decades and some kind, sometimes generations to come. But sometimes it makes sense for you to give them the money while you're still alive. Here's what I mean. Look, you've all been to funerals and you've heard them say wonderful things about people. I've been to funerals and I've heard them say wonderful things about people. I'm like, you know, that son of a gun has never said a nice thing to that person who's passed away when they were alive. <laughs> That's, I don't, are they up there saying nice things about this person to make themselves look better in front of the group? Or are they saying nice things about this person because they feel guilty they didn't say it when they were alive? In either case, I think it makes more sense for you to say nice things about an organization, to see how they treat people to see what they do with your money. Give them a little bit and see what they do and then give them a little bit more. There's no reason to give everything all at once unless it's an organization you have a history with. And that charitable contribution, in my opinion, should take place while you're alive. This way, when you give money when you pass away, you're not gonna be here to babysit those dollars. You've already seen how they handle it. You've seen a pattern of behavior. You have seen the people in charge and their a fiscal responsibility and that is key and if you plan that properly there may be a way for you to and this is a strategy we've seen when people pass away they donate their retirement account to a charity and the life insurance to their beneficiaries now what happens is when the retirement account goes to the charity that's a write-off in other words no taxes on that money if the retirement goes uh, to their beneficiaries, then it's a taxable event. Right. Those, those people have to pay money on That's pay right. income tax on those dollars. But when the beneficiaries receive the life insurance, there's no taxable event. Life insurance is tax free. So I want you to meet with your CPA, have a conversation, bring in your insurance professionals, bring in your retirement professionals, and sit down and say, here's what I'm trying to achieve, whether I pass away in 15 minutes, 15 years, or in 2000 and 45. I don't know, mm -hmm. but at least I need to have a plan. And that's what this is all about, right? You're doing things systematically. You're doing things on purpose and you don't let the tax man just take your money. Yeah, that can be one of the bigger expenses uh, of an estate is paying off the taxes. And it may not happen right away, but you give that money to your kids uh, and it's not been taxed before, they have a whole host of rules now that they have to follow and systematically take that out either over their lifetime or take it all out at once and, and start paying the tax man at that point. I, I want to touch on something very briefly. If you give a dollar from your retirement account, that person gets a dollar. But if you give a dollar in life insurance to your beneficiary, that might buy them $20 for every one. So, not not uh, something that I think you should shy away from. Life insurance can seem kind of morbid at times, but I'm telling you, you can you can leverage that money into a greater dollar amount and have it be tax-free. I think it's something worth considering. Yeah, for any very estate. efficient, very efficient way to pass on money to your heirs is considering life insurance as the proper tool to do that. Thanks for joining us, folks. You can always go to hometownstation.com, click on Total Financial Solutions, and we're going to be having, uh, this list is going to be up on the website as well, so you can have a chance to review get into a little bit more detail. If you have questions, you can always reach back to us at hometownstation.com. Click on Total Financial Solutions. That's Jeff Gerard. I'm Arif Hallaby. Every week at this time, you can go to hometownstation.com, Total Financial Solutions. We're here for you every week at this time. On AM 1220, this is KHTS.